Good morning, friends. Today we've got a very interesting lesson. It's lesson number five, When the Rocks Cry Out. And it's dealing with the subject of how archaeology plays a key role in validating and confirming the dependability of the Bible. And there's a lot of scriptures it's based on, and uh, we'll be sharing those as we go. We have a memory verse I'd invite you to say with me. And it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews 11, verse 24 and 25. And uh, if you're ready, we'll say that together. You ready? By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now you'll wonder, what does that have to do with archaeology? Stay with us. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Archaeology, the study of what you might find in the ancient record, in uh, the ruins from history, uh, maybe ancient writings, tells us something about ancient history. And especially in the, um, the early 19th century, the 1800s, more and more criticism began to arise about the dependability of the Bible. They called it, uh, you know, higher criticism. And they began to just question. It was a time of uh, spiritual darkness in one sense. They began to question, well, how do we know the Bible just wasn't assembled by a team of bamboozlers uh, who tried to fool everybody and the dates that they claimed these things happened didn't really happen and the places were all manufactured and fabricated and just a lot of suspicion and uh, cynicism developed about the Bible and its authenticity. And they began to question everything. Uh, maybe there were, we, you know, we don't have a lot of history about David and Abraham and Moses. Matter of fact, we don't even believe that there was writing, that men knew how to write back in the days of Moses. I mean, after all, the Egyptians were using cartoons. Keep in mind, they had not yet deciphered the Rosetta Stone during these times, and they couldn't figure out what hieroglyphics were. And so, they said, how could Moses have written all these things? And they began to just cast suspicion and doubt on the authenticity of the Bible in many respects. But as man began to dig, uh, the more he dug, the more the shovel confirmed the truth of the Bible. Now, we have a verse in uh, Luke 19.40. I don't have a lot of verses in our study today, but who's got a microphone? Ricky's got one there. Who will read that for me? Luke 19, verse 40. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if this should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Thank you. Now, some of you remember this story that uh, the adversaries of Jesus were telling him to ask the people to be quiet, and he said that if these should hold their peace, even the stones would cry out. Prophecy must be fulfilled. Uh, do stones speak? The Ten Commandments were written on what? I mean, in the Bible it says, the blood of Abel speaketh. So certainly something written speaks. You remember not only did God write the Ten Commandments on stone, but when the children of Israel crossed into the Promised Land, Joshua was instructed to erect a great big monolith, plaster it, and engrave on this enormous stone the words of the covenant of Mount Gerizim. And they did that. Stone speak. And they put the monument of stones there when they crossed the Jordan River so that they would be a, a testimony. Uh, the stones do speak in that respect. And we're finding out that the deeper that man digs in the ancient world, the biblical lands, the more it validates the authenticity of the Bible. And I think it's fair to say today, the Bible is the undisputed, most dependable book supplying history of the Middle East and the Bible lands. If you ask an honest archeologist, even the atheists, will say, while we may not believe in the God of the Bible and the religious aspects of the Bible, we are finding there is no book that provides better history than the Bible. Now, archaeologists used to say the dinosaurs died out slowly because of changes in the atmosphere. And I remember when I was going to school, the theory about why the dinosaurs died out and other species began to take the stage, it, it was based on some disease, some plague came through. But the more they dug, the more evidence there was that there had been some catastrophic, cataclysmic flood 
because all these dinosaurs were buried in piles of mud and they died quickly and they could see evidence of this all over the world. Well, the Bible tells us what that means. It's called the flood. But they said, we can't accept that. So they came up with the asteroid. How many of you have heard that? Just heard it again last week. This great asteroid struck the earth and it created great tsunamis that buried a lot of vegetation, which is where we get our coal and our oil. And this is true, that's where you get the coal and oil. It was all buried by layers of mud and pressure. And it wiped out the dinosaurs. But the copious quantities of debris that covered the dinosaurs, it would have extinguished all life on the planet if some of it had not been preserved somehow above the waters. Are you listening? Well, that's what the Bible says. So they're right in that the record of geology tells us that there was a catastrophic flood. They can't accept that it was the Bible. So they're looking all over the planet saying, which asteroid was it? Was it a big meteor that hit near the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula? Was it the one in New Mexico? Uh, which crater was it that wiped out the dinosaurs? Because they refused to believe it was Noah's flood. So there's a bias of people who don't want to believe the religious truth of the Bible. And that's very simple. It's because if, if it's true, then you're accountable to God about the way you're living. And people need to either believe it's true and live a life that's accountable to God, or they have to disprove it and say, this is all an accident. We are our own God. We don't have to answer to God. Miller Burroughs from Yale wrote, on the whole, however, archeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. More than one archeologist has found his respect for the Bible increased by the experience of excavation in Palestine. The more they dug, though they may have had doubts going into it, the more they dug, the more they found out the rocks do cry out. K.A. Kitchen, that's an interesting name, wrote, in terms of, gen of general reliability, the Old Testament comes out remarkably well, so long as its writings and writers are treated fairly and even-handedly. Now, some of the best prophecies that have uh, strengthened the validity of the Bible are very clear, precise prophecies in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19 to 22, and these relate to Babylon. So turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 13, 19 to 22. In Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch its tent there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there, but wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls, and ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. That means prance. The hyenas will howl in their citadels, and jackals in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. Saying that, now keep in mind, a prophecy from Isaiah and Jeremiah and others about the fall of Babylon was probably one of the most uh, astonishing prophecies. Let me explain why. Many of the capital nations of the world that had been conquered were later rebuilt. You know how many times Egypt's been conquered? And especially there near Alexandria, and uh, the region around Cairo, and has been built up, conquered, built up, conquered, built up. Because it was a good situation, they'd say, well, let's dust ourselves off, let's fix things. Um, that's why a lot of folks were wondering after Hurricane Katrina, they said, New Orleans is below sea level, should we really build it back up again? It's not the best place to put a lot of people. Uh, but Babylon was a great location, even Jerusalem on top of a hill. You know, it's 27 times the city's been burnt and conquered and rebuilt. Babylon was a great location, very fertile area, right by the Euphrates River. The idea that it would be conquered and not rebuilt was astounding. It, it was really ludicrous. I mean, that would be like, you know, Manhattan has thrived because it's, it's an island surrounded by rivers on a rock, a great place to support a city, a great defense point. And to say that Manhattan is going to be conquered and never going to be rebuilt. That's what it was like back then. This was the, the empire. Let me give you some statistics that tell you what Babylon looked like back then. The wall around the main city was more than 11 miles long, 85 feet thick at the base, and many gates, including the Ishtar Gate. 
Matter of fact, there's a picture of the Ishtar Gate that uh, has been reconstructed, you've got up there on the screen, with its enameled bricks showing 575 dragons and bulls and 120 lions. By the way, a lion was uh, sometimes used to depict um, Babylon. And three gorgeously decorated palaces of Nebuchadnezzar with its banquet hall and throne room 57 feet wide and 168 feet long. The city today remains in ruins. The entire city of Babylon was an immense square totaling 15 miles on each side with Marduk's temple and the Tower of Babylon at the center. Now, it tells us in history the city was divided by the Euphrates River running under the walls which also served to irrigate and air condition the entire metropolis and also to irrigate the one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. In the Bible, it talks about the Euphrates River drying up in Revelation. Many people wonder what that means. Well, the Jews knew what that meant. It's not specifically mentioned in the Bible, but it is mentioned in history. The way that Babylon fell was King Belshazzar, oh, and by the way, they didn't even think he existed. They said there was no king of the Bi in the Bible named Belshazzar. Keep in mind, Daniel's Babylonian name was Belteshazzar, not to be confused with Belshazzar, who is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar and the son of Nabadonis. Belshazzar was having a feast. He was sort of acting king while his father was away defending the kingdom in another location. And the Medo-Persians had surrounded the city the young king was a little bit arrogant. He said, we have nothing to worry about. They can get, never get through our walls. They'll never get over our walls. But he didn't realize they'd go under the wall. They diverted the Euphrates River where it ran under the walls into a dry lake bed. As the water level dropped in the middle of the night, they were all drunken and feasting. And they marched under the walls of the city. They found that the inner gates had been left open because the soldiers were drunk. And in one night, the city fell and they moved the capital somewhere else. Matter of fact, we got pictures here, an artist's rendition of how they went underneath the walls of ancient Babylon, and they entered in through the second gates. Isaiah 45, verse 1 says, And thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. This prophecy of Isaiah is given 150 years before Cyrus is born. Mentions him by name. That was one of the reasons the critics said, how can that be? How can that be true? And so that was foretold word for word in Isaiah. Then you go to Daniel, you see the fulfillment. It says, and the gates shall not be shut. Remember what I said? They went under the wall. The inner gates, once they got under the wall, they still had other gates. That's why they were so self-confident. They had been left open because they thought, why lock them? Because they can't get through the first set of gates. If they get through, then we'll lock them. Well, they went underneath the wall in the middle of the night. The soldiers were drunk, had, were not prepared, and the city fell. Now, during the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein knew that the prophecies of Isaiah said that Babylon would never be rebuilt. He said, I'm going to prove it wrong. I'm going to rebuild it. I will then move my capital from Baghdad to Babylon. And he began a very expensive process of rebuilding ancient Babylon. Now, some will say, see, it was rebuilt. It's vacant. The Arabs think it's haunted. They don't even want to work on it. They don't want to live there. So his building construction was stopped at the beginning of the first Gulf War because he had to put all of his resources into the, the defending the country. He had just resumed rebuilding the ruins again when the second Gulf War broke out. And then, of course, it has come to a screeching halt since then. Matter of fact, they've had a lot of problems with... Uh, looters going through the ancient ruins of Babylon and taking artifacts. So Marines are guarding it now. It's uninhabited. The prophecy was fulfilled. Can you say amen? It said it will not be inhabited. It will never again become a capital city, a thriving city. It was destroyed. And of course, uh, we know that uh, Saddam is not going to get a third chance. The Bible talks about the phenomenal wealth of Egypt, for example. All right, I want someone to help me. This is one of our scripture readings. Hebrews 11, verse 24, and read through verse 26. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, 
because he was looking ahead to his reward. It's interesting that Paul, who we believe wrote Hebrews, he makes a, a point when he goes through all the people of faith who chose to follow God, one he highlights is Moses as someone who really sacrificed the greatest riches in the world for Christ's sake. And he says, because he walked away from Egypt, implying that Egypt was one of the richest places in the world. Well, even though we knew they were great builders, during the 1800s they say uh, they didn't have all the treasures of Egypt. But some of you know the story of King Tut. You can uh, just look in history. Probably it's the undisputed greatest treasure find in, uh, well, you could say in modern times, when Howard Carter was there in Egypt and he uncovered in a poor king's tomb. This king does not even have a pyramid. He's buried underground. They just found a corridor leading down in the rock and they kept digging and pretty soon, I remember uh, reading about this, I used to do a whole presentation on uh, King Tut's treasures and we went to Egypt and went on a tour and I've seen them just within a few inches, probably not just millions, billions of dollars, priceless treasure. And when he first found this door that was still sealed, keep in mind all of the pyramids when they found them, they'd all been looted. They'd all been basically gutted by thieves millennia earlier. Some of these thieves were very, very uh, well-funded and determined. They tunneled through rock to get to the treasures. But when they found the unsealed door, the outer chamber had already been rummaged through, but then when they found the inner chamber, this unsealed door, and they got the press and everybody there, and they've actually got photographs of where he broke the seal, and he makes a little hole, and he sticks a light in, and as his eyes got adjusted, people said, do you see anything? And he said, yes, wonderful things. He saw the glint of gold everywhere. This was a poor king. You think about Ramses, some of the kings that lived during the time of Moses, and Moses would have been maybe the prince. He could have been at least a... Um, had a high office in the kingdom by virtue to his relationship, being adopted as a son of Pharaoh, and he turned his back on that incredible wealth. He was pampered everywhere he went. I mean, when he, he left Egypt at 40 years of age, how much of the wealth and the ease of Egypt do you think Moses was enjoying during that time in his life? He probably had his own private Learjet, and gilded Mercedes chariot, and I mean, just we're wearing Gucci clothes and just, I mean, he had everything that the rich and the famous had. And he walked away and he left with nothing but a staff in his hand, so to speak. He fled naked and he was willing to walk away from all of that because he thought that God had a higher calling for him. But we know the Bible's telling the truth when it talks about the riches he turned his back on. Can you imagine how fabulous it was? Moses was looking at the pyramids when he lived there when they still had their glazing on them and those pyramids, would, they'd shine in the sun because they were with polished um, stone. I'm trying to think of the word that glazed stone that had been baked. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful kingdom at that time. The Sphinx had its nose back then. All right. One of the other great uh, discoveries of history, and this is in your lesson. As a matter of fact, I think I got a couple of pages mixed up, but you won't mind. Was when they began to dig around on this tell called Tell... Mardika, and it's an a, a ancient city called Ebla. Did you read about that a little bit in your lesson? <clears throat> it's located in northwest Syria, about 55 kilometers south of Aleppo, and uh, it's famous mainly for the archives they found somewhere. I've seen everything from 14,000 to 2,000 cuneiform tablets. I guess some of them were broken. They counted them twice. I don't know, but there's a big disparity on how many they found. Everybody agrees it's more than 14,000 clay tablets, well-preserved. It was a virtual library. Most of this library was dealing with trade with surrounding nations. They were records, but it was very, very helpful because of the names that were given. This is a cuneiform language that they were able to decipher. They're able to read. There's experts that can read this, this language today. They dated from around 2,500 B.C. They're written in Sumerian and El Eblaite, a previously unknown Semitic language. Keep in mind the Jews spoke a Semitic language, so it's similar. I guess it's like the difference between Pastor Mike Thompson and myself. 
or the Australians or New Zealands and the Americans. I mean, they were dialects, they understood each other, but there were differences. It's like we say schedule, they say schedule. And uh, we say program, we spell it where just it ends with an M. In England, program ends with an E. You know what I'm saying? And so there were some, some differences, but it was a language they could communicate with. So keeping that in mind, this discovery found more clay tablets than had been produced by all other excavations at that point. So it was just a trove of information. And of course, I'm not even sure if they've read all of it yet. Uh, but early on, they began to discover, by the way, this big discovery was in the 1970s. They found a lot of biblical writings concerning the patriarchs to be viable. They contained extensive trade records. They have the oldest reference to Jerusalem dating from before the time of Abraham, except it's not called Jerusalem. You know what it's called? Salem. What did Jerusalem, what did Abraham refer to? Melchizedek is the king of Salem. That city, which is later known as Jerusalem, is mentioned in the tablets of Ebla. Documents written on these clay tablets also refer to some of the patriarchs. For instance, it mentions Abraham, Ishmael, David. Oh, in the 1800s, they doubted the existence of King David. They said he is a figment. He is a fable from Hebrew mythology. He never lived. There's no records we find of David. Then they dug up the tablets of Ebla. They found reference of da to David. Israel is mentioned. Esau is mentioned. Saul is mentioned. Kings are named from which we know uh, these, there were no other sources in history. Bible cities are referred to. Now here, remember I told you about the prophecy in I Isaiah chapter 13? The bombshell in the Ebla tablets was when there were records of trade with Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, that, that just blew them away because keep in mind, this is from the time of Abraham. Did they still exist then? It was during the time of Abraham they were finally destroyed. So they had trade records of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plains. Um, they're mentioned in the same order as they are in the Bible. Sodom, then Gomorrah. Same way. It speaks of Ur as being the territory of, Her of Haran. Keep in mind it was Ur from where Abraham ha came from. It speaks of two Urs. Ur of the Chaldees. The Bible makes clear that uh, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees, thus showing the Bible writer was aware there are two. He distinguished Abraham didn't come just from Ur, but Ur of the Chaldees, because there was a couple of cities by that name. Not only that, but it mentions the Sumerians, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites are all mentioned in the Ebla tablets. So a great deal of uh, uh, authenticity was added to the Bible's credibility with this incredible discovery. Another thing that happened is they said at the time of Moses, they did not have the ability to write. And then they discovered uh, what they call the Law Code of Hammurabi in 1901 and 1902 in Susa. How many of you have heard of the Law Code of Hammurabi? Hammurabi, I've heard it said a couple different ways. Um, it shows that uh, the practices of the patriarchs, they were common practices. It's very similar in even some of the laws that you find. Uh, they said Moses may have stolen his law from Hammurabi. Well, a lot of these laws were, were common sense. Don't murder. Don't steal. I mean, is, does it mean that Moses copied it from someone else because it says that? I always thought that was sort of an absurd argument. Why people doubt the authenticity of the Bible when so much of it has been substantiated by archaeology? And uh, I hope that as you read these things, your faith will grow, that when you read the Bible, you're not just reading a religious book or a collection of fables. This is, I believe, the most accurate history book in the world. And that doesn't just start uh, after Abraham. I believe it's accurate from Genesis 1-1. And I think that should time go on, they'd be able to confirm everything that you find from Genesis 1. Matter of fact, it'll all be confirmed someday, trust me, to the present day that it is a book that is the perfect word of God that he has preserved for us.